Welcome everybody. Uh, lovely to see you all. Um, this is welcome to the, the very the fourth and, and last of our current series of religion and art talks. Um, those of you who've been before, welcome back. Those of you who haven't been before, uh, very nice you could join us. Uh, recordings of most of the previous talks and indeed the Religion Art Forum presentations that preceded these talks are available on uh, YouTube and you can access them via our website religionart.org. This session will also be recorded so please if you don't want your um, it'll be the speakers who, who, are, who pretty much go on recording but um, if you're in the audience it may possi possibly be that you're Face and your name, and if you speak, your voice will be uh, recorded and placed on YouTube. So if you'd rather that didn't happen, uh, feel free to turn your camera off. Thank you very much. So um, it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Jarell Robinson Brown, who I first met in a church. He's a clergy colleague of mine. I met him at his church, St. Bottles. Um, but um, it may be worth telling you the story uh, briefly that when we met, we met for a service. I, I was leading a service and he was assisting at the time. And um, and afterwards, uh, we both re uh, found that we were going to the same thing afterwards, which is the Whitechapel Gallery, to see the Astor Gates exhibition. I was going out of interest and Tyrell was going out of interest, but also because he was going to be talking, doing a talk on Theaster Gates work at the White Chapel. So that was really nice. We went along and we were able to look at the show together. So, and I went to his talk, which was great. So that was our start. And when we set, when uh, Nina and I set up these talks, we thought it'd be great to ask Tyrell to speak. Now, Tyrell, um, uh, is going to speak about music. Um, most of our speakers have spoken about visual art um, and as I've already indicated, Jarrell is well qualified to do the same and I'm just going to put a little link in the post. So if you want to read something that Jarrell's written about visual art, um, there's an interesting essay uh, there that he wrote for the um, St. Mary Magdalene School of Theology on Christian symbolism, race, and Christian art. Um, uh, Jarrell's written about race and depictions of Jesus in Christian art. So you can check that out later, but please don't read it now because I'd rather you listen to Jarrell speaking live. Um, Jarrell is uh, the assistant curate of St. Bottle without Allgate, which is, as I say, where we met um, in the Diocese of London. He's also visiting scholar in contemporary spirituality at Sarum College, Salisbury, and he is vice chair of the LGBT Christian charity One Body, One Faith, which works for the full inclusion of LGBT people in the church. Church uh, Jarrell uh, publishes in, uh, has, has published uh, many times in the areas of queer theology, liberation theology, and trauma theology. And his most recent book uh, is Black, Gay, British, Christian, Queer, The Church and the Famine of Grace, which I highly recommend. So, um, I think, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Jarrell. And just to remind everybody of the format, um, Jarrell will speak for about half an hour or so, perhaps a little longer if we're lucky. And then uh, I, myself and Nina will um, respond briefly and then hand over to you, the audience, to please do ask questions of Jarrell. You can do so Ah, oh, my fan is noisy. Okay, I will turn it off. Um, but I just finished what I was going to say, which is that uh, please do ask questions. You can do that in two ways. You can put questions in the chat, or you can raise your hand, and we'll call upon you. And if you'd like, if you prefer to speak, um, feel free to put your questions or indeed comments in the chat while Drell is speaking. But um, he, unless he really wants to, we, we don't invite him to um, respond during his talk. It's just a way of you being able to, um, you know, formulate formulate the question when, uh, to, to relay the question when, when it occurs to you and also it's helpful, helpful for us because you, uh, we have a few questions that we can um, 
get going with once we get to that point. So as I say, please feel free to use the chat function. Um, Nina, would you like to say hello before we start? Yes, hello and welcome everybody. Nice to see some of you back and welcome to those of you who are new. Look forward to the talk. And, and Nina's also going to say a few words at the end as well about uh, just to sum up um, our series and maybe talk about some possibilities for the future. James, is there anything I've forgotten before I hand over to Jarrell? No, I think I think you've covered all of the things I'd normally say. Great, <laughs> lovely. I'm now going to turn my sound off and hand over to Jarrell. Thank you. I hope you don't melt with the fan off, Mark. But <laughs> um, thank you so much for the invitation. It's really, really lovely to be able to be here with you this evening. Um, and to be able to share on an area that I haven't really spoken about in this way before. Um, so before I share my screen and, and show you things on the PowerPoint, um, some of what I'm saying today originated from a paper that I gave um, at Ashore College in Durham um, at a conference on Catholicism, literature and the arts. And that was in 2019. And I was speaking there about the Roman Catholic faith of lots of um, French organ composers. Um, so some of my thoughts are um, based on that. And today, especially what I want to talk about is essentially how music, and especially French music, has shaped the person and the priest that I am um, in ways that I think I've only really begun to appreciate in trying to prepare a bit um, actually for this talk. I hadn't really thought about those. So I will start, start by um, sharing my screen and I will make sure I click the right buttons to share sound as well. Um, because one of the things that I want to do is share some videos of organ music in France. So, keynote, play, great. Somebody, uh, if you can't see my screen, then unmute and say so. Hopefully you can see it. And so what I want to talk about today is, um, firstly, my own positionality within all of this. So the first thing I will say is that I'm a bit of a rare species in the Church of England, um, in that I'm a gay priest in the Church of England, but that wouldn't make me rare. Um, what makes me rare in the Church of England is being an openly black gay priest in the Church of England. Um, there's only two of us. And the other uh, openly gay black priest is a priest in Manchester um, called Father Gide McCauley. Um, and it's only us two. And why I mentioned that at the beginning is because I think it's meant I've had to follow a certain space in the life of the church and in the world um, for someone like me. And so I share these three images, um, firstly to show how early music entered my life as a child. Um, I was raised by my grandparents, that's me and my nan. There was a Hoffman piano in the home, I started to play it and one thing led to another and music just became part of my life quite early on. The middle image is me speaking um, after my ordination in 2014. Um, that's me in Wales at uh, the Pride in Cymru in, in Cardiff and speaking in the faith tent there. And the other image is of a uh, ceremony that um, occurred in Amsterdam at the Sandberg Institute where queer people of faith um, who were people of color were invited to share in a ceremony that in Christianity we remember every Monday Thursday of the washing of feet, which normally happens in church. And I prepared this space in Amsterdam um, for all people to kind of share in this ceremony and to wash one another's feet. Um, and that was another space where as a priest, I was in a space um, where the intersection of race, uh, religion, sexuality and art kind of overlapped. So I had a life where uh, learning music was very important. That's me trying to remember and memorize a, a very long bark fugue um, and a picture of me at the end of a recital. Um, and these are some images from uh, dressing rooms before two different recitals um, over the years. The bottle of wine was for after the concert. Um, and I have those images. I have no idea why I took them the first time, but they've been quite useful in me reflecting on how life has changed from uh, this kind of space where I got ready to walk out on stage to uh, this space where I prepare um, on Sunday mornings to go not to the stage but to the altar and how different those spaces are um, but also the ways in which they can sometimes be quite similar. 
So I want to talk also about the sacramental dimension of music. Now, what do I mean about that, the sacramental dimension of music? In Christian theology, we talk about sacraments um, as being visible signs of an invisible grace. Um, so we believe that in, in Christian theology, God uh, manifested God's self um, in the person of Jesus Christ at what we might call the incarnation. And in Christian theology, when we think about music and art, um, I think as a Christian theologian, I would say that it's the incarnation that makes art and music um, vehicles for sacramental grace. And that actually we can encounter something of God through music and through art because of the fact that God became flesh in Jesus Christ. And so for me, when I'm preparing to say Mass, um, in the same way that when I was preparing to perform, there were some things that were important, meditation, um, dress, silence, listening to a building, which is something I learned as a musician, that you, you don't just listen to the sounds that you make, but you listen to the space in which you make them. Um, getting to know a composer in the same way that now I get to know the gospels and get to know um, theologians texts. Um, and also the sense of improvisation and interpretation. So I was taught and trained as a musician to interpret music, which was a very French thing. Um, and it meant that when you came to a, a score, you didn't just uh, take the dots on the page as all that there was to learn about that piece of music, but that was basically the, the very foundation and there was much more that you would find and develop yourself. So learning the notes, if you like, was one of the very early stages of learning a piece. Um, but what was much more important and what was a sign of a mature musician was being able to interpret something um, of that piece. So not only how does it make you feel, but, but what are you trying to create for other people to experience. And I think the same is true for liturgy. On a Sunday morning, it's not a performance, but I am trying to make sure that I create a space in which both I and the congregation can encounter God. Um, and I would say there's something very similar there um, about how I as a musician try to create space in which both I and the audience could travel and journey to a much deeper place. And then improvisation being important, very uh, key skill in French uh, classical music training, um, the sense that you should be able to create music on the spot, um, either from a melody or just from whatever it is that you can imagine and create. Um, I think as a black gay priest in a church that wasn't made for someone like me, um, improvisation is, is part of life and something that I have to do regularly. So thinking about that sacramental dimension, of music, the fact that music allows us to encounter God. This is a picture I took when I was studying in Paris sometime around 2008 or nine, I'll say, um, in a church called uh, Saint Jean Baptiste de La Salle um, near the uh, Pasteur Metro in France. Um, and I was, I was learning a piece of music in this church, I was practicing and I suddenly stopped and noticed this man with his arms outstretched in front of the altar, um, praying, I imagine. And I hope that the music in some way perhaps helped him to do that. Um, but it does showed, showed me in that church how um, we experience and encounter God in so many different ways and places. And actually that's, that's a church which is empty, that's not the middle of a liturgy. Um, but he is having an, an encounter, an experience of, of something other than himself. We might even say the divine. What I want to do um, now is just show us a video. So we'll come back to that quote. I want to show us um, next a video of uh, someone improvising. Um, this is a Gregorian chant. And in France, it's quite common at the end of mass for the organist to take a portion of the chant of um, the mass setting and to use that to improvise. Um, and so what we'll see in a minute is a French organist called Philippe Lefebvre, who is at Notre Dame in Paris, improvising on this Gregorian chant, which is um, the Salve Regina. And he just uses the first part of this Gregorian chant, which goes like this. I'll only sing the beginning for you. Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita dulcedur et spes nostra salve. If you remember that melody, um, you will hear it in this piece of music. Um, and hopefully everyone will be able to see and hear this. So.
So I promise that the next um, organ improv that we listen to won't be quite as bombastic as that. Um, but we might be wondering why, why um, is improvisation important and why does the organ um, have anything to do with, with um, why I'm trying to reflect on the importance of French music for me. One of the things about that improvisation that we just watched is that it was based, yes, on um, Gregorian chant, but in France there's a strong tradition of the sortie being the exit music, um, being part of the organist's offering to God. And therefore people tend not to applaud for the sortie and they tend to sit there in quietness and listen to that because actually in the Catholic tradition in France, the mass hasn't ended until the organist has made that offering. And I think in the same way that uh, the theologian Sarah Coakley helped me to connect the practice of prayer with theology. Um, in France, it was the French tradition that helped me to connect music with my own uh, spirituality and religious practice. So why the pipe organ in particular? Um, in 1903, Pius X uh, published a document, a motu proprio, um, entitled The Organ and Instruments. And in this, uh, this document outlines that the principal office of sacred music is to clothe the liturgical text in suitable melodies to enable the understanding of the faithful. The proper aim of sacred music is to add greater efficacy to the liturgical text and as a result, move more easily to devotion, the faithful as they prepare to receive the grace of the holy mysteries. So the improvisation that we watch according to this 1903 document is actually there to add something to the liturgy which enables the faithful to enter into it in a more deeper and respectful way. Again in 1963 Pope Paul VI uh, promulgated a document on the sacred liturgy called Sacrosanctum Concilium within which were these words, the pipe organ is to be held in high honour in the Latin church as the traditional musical instrument the sound of which has the power not only to add a wonderful splendor to the church's ceremonies, but also to lift up people's minds in a remarkable way to God and the things on high. So in this document, Sacrosanctum Concilium, we see the pipe organ being given the place of honor and privilege within the life of the church. In this Vatican II document, built on an earlier document that forbids the use of pianos and bands, the directive is given that this instrument, known as the king of instruments, is to be held in high esteem by the body of Christ. And this, because its sound has power to add splendor to the church's ritual, as well as the ability to enhance our experience of the transcendent in a remarkable way. The document goes on to say that musicians filled with the Christian spirit should feel that they have a vocation to cultivate church music and to enrich its treasure. They should see that their compositions display notes of a truly sacred music. With that in mind, I want to recall an experience I had about 10 years ago, out of which the questions um, which give rise to some of my thoughts here began. Before I entered seminary, I spent time studying organ music and improvisation privately in Paris, and I attended mass frequently in the Cathedral of Notre Dame, um, where we saw uh, Philippe Lefebvre improvising, which sadly, um, that, that cathedral was damaged in fire, and the organ, thank God, has saved and has survived and will be back in there hopefully once it reopens. But one particular morning in Notre Dame, during one of my first visits to Paris, I decided that it was time to hear this organ that I had heard only in recordings. Um, I wanted to hear it used in the liturgy on a Sunday morning. And once the mass had ended, the sortie, that exit music began. An often, particularly at Notre Dame, purely improvised piece of music. And as I stood up and turned to look at the organ, um, as I was about to make my way out, what I saw has embedded itself in my memory. It was a man of about 40 years old, gazing up at this huge blaring instrument and covering his mouth as he broke down in tears and wept. And as a musician and theologian and priest, questions began to arise in my mind, primarily questions about what elicited such a response in that man. What, if anything at all, had occurred within that space, within the liturgy, within his life, within him, that meant that a valid response to that music, potentially the only possible response, was that of uncontrollable weeping. But secondarily, questions arose for me about the artist behind the music, unseen, high up in that organ loft, above the west door, an artist unable to witness the effect of that music on the individual in question. 
To what extent was that a genuine relationship between artist and audience? And to what degree, if any, had the organist been filled with, as that Vatican II document said, the Christian spirit? So artists, I think, are intermediaries. They're intermediaries between the composer and the audience in the same way in which, as a priest, I'm often seen, although I don't often feel it, as being an intermediary between God and God's people. So where a musician might stand in the place of between the music and the audience, I stand now each Sunday, um, in a sense for some people, between God and the people, trying to be a porous, if you like, embodiment um, of, of a channel of, of holiness and grace for those who gather around us. I began studying music in France um, with my teacher who's seen here, Sophie Veronique Cochefer Choplin, and she has a very long name. Um, the picture on the left is us in London, the picture of the right is us in Paris. And I studied with her for about, I don't know, six to seven years. I'm constantly traveling to Paris and um, meeting her in London also for lessons. But the French tradition of organ playing and improvisation is really um, captured with this person called Marcel Dupre, who was an organist also at the same church where my teacher plays in Paris, Saint Sulpice, um, in a very nice part of Paris. And he was someone who was a devoted Roman Catholic and wrote lots of music um, dedicated to the music of the church, to Gregorian chant. And really the, the main organs in Paris out of which this uh, tradition of improvisation really began are the four organs that you see here on the far right, the bottom right of the screen, you can see the organ of Notre Dame um, with that wonderful rose window behind it. And um, beside it to the left, there's the organ of Saint Etienne Dumont um, where Maurice de Rufle was organist. Um, not a cave call organ, so a different one to the others in the picture. On the top left is the uh, organ from Saint Clotilde, the Basilica in Paris, where César Franck was organist for a very long time. And on the bottom left is the uh, organ at Saint Sulpice, where my teacher plays, and where Marcel Dupre, uh, Vidor, and lots of other famous organists throughout the um, ages um, composed and lived. And all of these instruments are used as ways of contributing to the mass and to the liturgy and enhancing its life. And I show you these instruments because although they all look the same, they've all undergone lots of different changes in time and they all sound very different. And French organs um, are made slightly different to English organs, I won't bore you with the detail, um, but the, the maker of most of the organs in France um, called Cave Cole. He existed during a certain period. He made organs so that they could contribute to the liturgy in a certain way. And he moved the organ on from being, um, if you like, an instrument used really for the accompanying of hymns and for playing solo music um, to becoming what we might call symphonic instruments, able to create and recreate the sounds of an orchestra um, and to really contribute to the whole of the liturgical life of the church through making their own contribution and through having certain different stops added to them to make sounds that you would only hear um, in orchestras really. And here are some of those organists which are uh, famous organists throughout the centuries here in the bottom left is Jean de Messieu, a um, very famous organist. She uh, traveled a lot in the UK and in London and performed very much um, in different places. To the right is Suzanne Chesmartin who was an organist also in Paris. Above her is Roland Falcinelli uh, giving a lesson in her older years, just there um, teaching from a manuscript to a younger organist. And on the left is Roland Falcinelli, the same person teaching uh, my teacher, Sophie Veronique, um, in her youth. And I show these pictures to show you that um, there are many women in the French tradition of organ music who were extremely famous as composers and as performers and who made their own distinct contribution to the life of French organ music, even in the church at a time when um, women were not able to contribute to liturgy. Actually in France, through music, many women were able to have a central part in the liturgy through the music that they wrote and through the music that they played. So I want to talk a bit about legacies. Um, how do I, as this particular body, um, come to all of this stuff? Um, so in terms of my own personal identity, I can't trace my history back very far. I can go back to my great grandfather on my uh, mother's side. 
And on my father's side, I can only go back to my grandmother, um, my great grandmother, sorry. But I can't go any further back. And that's because of the history of slavery and colonialism, which means that we just don't know who came before us. Um, and whoever did come before us, before the names I can find, would have either been enslaved people or people who were freed from slavery. But when it comes to music, I can chase a musical lineage back a lot further. Um, the man on the left, Lado Pelmuta, was my teacher's teacher um, in terms of piano study. And on the right, his teacher, Maurice Ravel. Um, Vlado Pelmuta was someone who studied in Paris during the Second World War. He lost his eye running away from the Nazis, um, trying to jump over a barbed wire fence. And he was Maurice Ravel's only student. And so I feel a direct link to some of this French music. Maurice Ravel was a very famous French composer. Um, he wrote the Bolero, which is a famous piece of music, which many of you may know. Um, but I feel this, this real link to the French music tradition because of this link with Vlade Pelmuta, who taught my teacher, Jeremy Davis. But where do I sit within this lineage? Um, I tried to trace back how far I could go um, through some of my teachers. And uh, JRB, that's me on the left. If I go above me, I go to my organ teacher, Sophie Veronique, and I end up immediately in France. Um, I can go back to lots of organists, people like Vidor, who's the Carter, many of you will know, and I can get back to J.S. Bach eventually. Um, if I go through piano teachers, I go to England again with Jeremy Davis before getting to France, then to Vlado Pelmuta, and I can get very quickly to big names like Fauré or Chopin and Liszt and Beethoven, um, Haydn and Mozart, back to J.S. Bach. Um, but it was very interesting to me that I could chase this lineage um, as, as a person of colour in the UK, um, right back, but I can't do the same with uh, my family heritage, which was an interesting thing for me to think about and reflect on. Here are some of the places in which I've uh, played as an organist, so most recently um, as an organist in Walsingham, I gave a recital, that was the last organ recital I gave. Um, I have a, a memory of being at Hereford Cathedral sometime around 2011, St Paul's Cathedral, I wasn't performing there, just playing um, as a quite young person then on an RCO, the Royal College of Organist Day, where we would be taken on tours um, and at King's College Cambridge. Again, organs look quite similar, but each one has its own character and its own dimension. So I want to think more about how faith, before I close, um, connects to music. Um, how do we understand music having a sacramental character? But I think it's true to say that music does change us. And one of the things that I always remember hearing about is a pianist called James Rhodes talking about the fact um, that when he first encountered Bach, it completely changed his life. And he talks about how it felt um, to hear a piece of Bach and um, what it did to him. I want to just quote something from James Rhodes. He says, under the covers I went, headphones on, middle of the night, dark and impossibly quiet. And I hit play and heard a piece by Bach that I had not heard before. And it took me to a place of such magnificence, such surrender, hope, beauty, infinite space. It was, he says, like touching God's face. It felt like I'd been plugged into an electrical socket. Neither before nor since have I ever experienced anything like it. It shattered me and released some kind of inner gentleness that hadn't seen the light of day for 30 years. There is something I think about music um, which can enable us, um, whether it's religious music or otherwise, to encounter something of God. One of my favorite theologians, um, a Jewish theologian, Rabbi Heschel, says this about music um, and also about prayer. He's talking about music and prayer. So the only language that seems to be compatible with the wonder and mystery of being is the language of music. Music is more than just expressiveness. It is rather a reaching out towards a realm that lies beyond the reach of verbal propositions. Verbal expression is in danger of being taken literally and of serving as a substitute for insight. Words become slogans, slogans become idols, but music is a refutation of human finality. Music is an antidote to higher idolatry. 
While other forces in society combine to dull our mind, music endows us with moments in which the sense of the ineffable becomes alive. Listening to great music is a shattering experience, throwing the soul into an encounter with an aspect of reality to which the mind can never relate itself adequately. Such experiences undermine conceit and complacency and may even induce a sense of contrition and a readiness for repentance. I am, he says, neither a musician nor an expert on music, but the shattering experience of music has been a challenge to my thinking on ultimate issues. Music leads us to the threshold of repentance, of unbearable realization of our own vanity and frailty and of the terrible relevance of God. I would describe myself as a person who has been smitten by music, as a person who has never recovered from the blows of music, and yet music is a vessel that may hold anything. It may express vulgarity, it may impart sublimity, it may utter vanity, it may inspire humility, it may engender fury, it may kindle compassion, it may convey stupidity, and it can be the voice of grandeur. It often voices man's highest reverences, but often brings to expression frightful arrogance. I think that quote really sums up for me my experience of studying music um, and how music has shaped me as a priest and as a person. Um, I think it's shown me the value of discipline. I think performance has taught me something about courage and boldness, um, about learning what it means to sometimes fall flat on your face in public in front of people, whether it's through a memory lapse in the midst of performing a piece um, or through um, just not being able to achieve what you want to achieve musically. Um, I think it teaches you humility and perseverance. Um, and for me, something definitely about prayer. When he says music leads us to the threshold of repentance, of the realization of our own vanity and frailty and of the terrible relevance of God, um, encountering God as a musician in music has taught me also as a priest that we can encounter God in all kinds of places, um, not just in churches or in places of worship, but also um, wherever we might be where God wants to meet us. I'm going to close now just very quickly. I wanted to show you how much French music is uh, religious when it comes to organ music in a very short period. Um, these are just some of the pieces composed um, by César Franck, Vido and Villa. Not many religious pieces, but almost all of their organ compositions are based on religious music. Um, Marcel Dupré is the organist who writes the most religious music, and he is the most Catholic of all of the organists in the period that I was talking about. Um, Maurice Duflet, Longley, and Messiaen also um, captivated in their musicianship by the language and the music of the church. And Jean-Jacques Grunemald and Jehan Alain also in the same way, almost all of their compositions just uh, in some ways spiritual and religious. And these three female composers, um, again, it just shows you how much the Catholic tradition and the musical tradition in France um, in terms of organ music is so founded upon um, Catholic liturgy. I want to stop just by sharing one last improvisation, which is only a few minutes long. And then if we break for questions and answers, that will be great.
Thank you so much. I wanted to share that clip with you just to show you how improvisation can be a, a communal exercise in terms of you need other musicians to help you to improvise, um, especially on some very large instruments because you can't do it all yourself. And there's something also there, I think, about um, making music with other people um, in the context of the liturgy. Um, but that's all that I'll say for now, and I, I hope that was it. Okay. Thank you. Ralph, thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I can, yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. That was really, truly wonderful. Um, I really enjoyed that so much. And um, as I said at the beginning, you know, we could we could have invited you to speak about, you know, visual art. Um, but our focus is on on practice. And, you know, you, you really spoke from the heart about the practice of religion, the practice of music. So thank you so much. And um, and of course, men, you know, music, of course, is is art um and many uh, well a number quite a, a number of of the people who've who've um presented it previously in in the forum um i'm thinking particularly of, well actually nina herself um but also linda mary montano and donna matthews mm. you know have 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 um have, you know music was is central to their practice and in fact donna is undertaking a ph i don't know if she's here today but Donna's undertaking a PhD where she's looking at the theology of improvisation. Um, so, you know, lovely, lovely resonance is there between your talk and, and, and our previous talks. Um, and as someone's already put in the, in the chat, uh, I'm glad to see things are coming in. That's great. Um, Sarah Mark has already suggest, said uh, it's a pity that most organists are hidden away in a loft. This is amazingly physical, something jazz like about it in its powerful wildness, incredible. The performative nature of it, you know, I think, uh, again, links to uh, to this sort of expanded notion of visual art, you know, which incorporates performance um, today. And um, and and again, the notion of improvisation. You also spoke about interpretation, and it really made me think about how improvisation, in terms of um, the practice of religion. You know, improvisation is. Uh, you spoke nicely, very nicely about how you know the the necessity of improvisation when it comes to leading worship, and uh, and there are certain church traditions that are, of course, you know, the charismatic traditions and Pentecostal traditions that are very, uh, you know, ve very very much concerned with improvisation. But interpretation, which is the other strand you spoke about, is maybe um you know it made me think about how how certain certain theological traditions or or, or ecclesiastical traditions but uh you know are, are very suspicious of interpretation and they tend to be the ones that are exclude we may say exclusive mm -hmm. it's interesting that some some exclusive churches are very focused on improvisation so I, i'm not quite sure I don't know. I don't have a theory about this. I'm just. I just think it's kind of, kind of interesting, and um, and it and it really leads me to my question. Really, to I guess that's the background to the question I want to ask you, which is about how music. And in your last quote, the rabbi you quoted, which is a beautiful quote, spoke to this in 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 a sense. But you know, it's always struck me that music, as a, an art form, and as a cultural form, is somehow Inher I don't know if it's inherent, but culturally it is clearly more open to to spirituality as a as an expression, as an explicit expression of spirituality, and and perhaps arguably kind of cultural in cultural inclusivity also than than other art forms, um, visual art for example, and I've always, often wondered why why that is, whether it's something inherent. Yeah. Or, what, or, 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 or if, it, if, or to the extent that it's cultural, how that that happens, and I just wondered whether you might uh, have any thoughts about that from your sure. perspective. Well, as you were speaking, I was just thinking that you know that I don't think there's been a civil rights movement or a movement for justice and equality that hasn't involved some kind of chant or rally song, and how there's something about uh, music, you know, whether it's thinking about apartheid South Africa or. Um, civil rights in America or whatever it might be has always had some way of bringing people together I think um, and I really saw that a lot when I was living and working in Wales for five years 
of how important music was to the Welsh um, as part of their identity and cultural um, sensibility, I think, you know, something that brings people together. Um, and there's something about music and singing, I think, in particular, that causes you to kind of um, develop and nurture the hope that's in you, you know, to, to feel slightly more uplifted about whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and I don't think that's by chance. You know, I think we were made to make music, actually. Um, and that is an inherent part of um, who we are as, as human beings. Um, but to go back to the, the other point you were making, I, I might annoy some people on the call, but I would say that I think the conservative Christians of the world are kind of some of the early musicians or the historical performance people in, in music who say, you know, that actually music can be performed in this particular way. And all you need to do is reproduce it in a way in which um, it was originally performed and you know on on instruments of the same period and you can't do anything else with it you know you can't play Bach on the piano you can't play Bach on other instruments it has to be on um on early instruments and I I struggle with that but I think in France particularly with the period I was talking about um people are really pushing the boundaries of the organ as an instrument um and also of of church music you know, so it wasn't without controversy some of the improvisation stuff and interpretation thing that was happening in France um, there were lots of people who were very unhappy about it. Um, but I think that shows something about also our, how we are as people, that we're not all the same. Um, and you know, I, I would see conservative Christians, if you like, just looking at the, the black dots on the page of the music, you know, in comparison, not really thinking about um, how we might interpret those dots. Um, and perhaps liberal or progressive Christians being a bit more humble about how much we can actually know about the original authors of things. Um, can we really tell what it what it is that you know Bach or Beethoven wanted in a particular bar of music um, if they didn't really say? How how much can we know? You know, and the same I think is true of, of bits of scripture. Can we can we get the whole context and everything about what's being said um, so many years after a text was written, you know? When sometimes we don't even know who the author is, <laughs> you know. Um, so there's definitely a parallel there, I think. Thank you. I'm going to start reading it. We've got a few questions coming in, uh, but please, people, do remember you can also just if you if you'd rather not formulate a, a question, if you if you if you would like to just raise your hand and and um, you know ask a question or even just reflect back and maybe formulate a question as you're speaking, please feel free. We're we're quite informal. Um, so Nina's asked. Um, what are, I'll, I'm going to read both of these out actually, uh, Jarell, then you can take them in whichever order you prefer. Yeah. One is what are considered exclusive churches? Um, oh, I should, I should, sorry, I beg your pardon. I should read out Nala, uh, Nala Torbay asked, are you a Catholic priest, Father? And uh, Jarell responded, hi Nala, I'm an Anglican priest in the Catholic tradition of the Church of England. And I'm sure you could expand on that if you if you wanted to. Um, but so perhaps in, in relation to Nina's question, what are considered exclusive churches? And Louise Higgs has asked, whose piano was it within your childhood home that you first played and inspired your musical journey? Fine, yeah. Um, so the, the first question I will take about uh, considered exclusive churches. So within Christianity, um, in the East and the West, Christians don't agree on everything, and, and we never have done, to be honest. Um, you know, we spent years in the early life of the church um, arguing about who Jesus Christ was, and that took a long time for us to decide on. We still, East and West, don't agree on that, actually, um, in reality. Um, people understand Jesus in different ways, um, and we don't talk about that often. Um, but on a more local level, in terms of exclusive, there are churches, for example, which um, can't or don't, I'll say don't, actually, um, accept the ministry of women. Um, or don't accept the ministry of LGBT people. There are churches which don't offer um, the sacraments or the gifts of God to all people. Um, churches which can be kind of deliberately monochrome in terms of class or race sometimes. Um, and which sometimes consciously are so, you know, might not be able to name it or might not um, want to own that. But often some church spaces can be very exclusive. So um, that's exclusive churches. And the opposite of that are churches which we would call inclusive, which are trying their best to be um, churches in which anyone can find a home and and feel welcome um, and where all kinds of people are able to be part of the ministry and leadership of the church 
um, but very few places are truly inclusive um, because inclusion is, is actually really hard work. Um, and the other bit of the question, whose piano was it within your childhood home? So my nan, who I grew up with, was gifted a piano by one of her um, church friends. And she wanted to learn to play. She didn't ever learn to play, but it was just there. And I think as a kid, I just kind of kept hitting at it. And I probably annoyed her a lot. And she'd have probably just said, you know, okay, let's get you someone who can actually teach you how to play the thing so you don't keep um, banging on it all the time. Um, so I started to have lessons, but I always remember wanting to study the organ. Um, but I couldn't find an organ teacher until much later. Um, and I was very lucky to get um, bursaries and scholarships, which enabled me to study in Paris and to study music, um, particularly the organ, which is what I always wanted to learn. But that took a long time before I could find a teacher. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, if I could just add to the question of uh, exclusive and inclusive churches, there is something called the inclusive church movement. Um, and uh, in fact, St. Botolph's, where Jarrell now serves um, and where I used to help out occasionally, um, is an in, a member of Inclusive Church. The, um, the problem <laughs> for Inclusive Churches or, or those of us who, who wish to be inclusive within the Church of England is that there is um, a legal situation where um, priests in the Church of England are not allowed, it's, it's illegal for us to marry people of the same sex. So we are legally required to deny the sacrament of marriage to some people, which um, I'm, I don't mind saying with my collar on it is, a, is an abomination. Absolutely, yeah. Um, Sherelle Angeline, uh, Nala has her hand up. I'll come to you just in a minute, Nala, so please keep your hand up. Yeah. Sherelle, Sherelle Angeline has asked, hello, Jarell, how do you see contemporary versus classical church music? Have you experimented with contemporary church music? Mm. Um, I haven't. I haven't really experimented with contemporary church music in the sense that I've never really been in a context where um, the people who came to church would want that um, or would respond positively to it. Um, but I've experienced it in the sense of I've, I've attended churches where contemporary church music has been the thing, and where you know there isn't an organ in sight, um, and where you know more charismatic Christians. Um, worship with either a band or keyboard or something else um, and of course in other parts of the world so when I when I visit churches in Egypt for example of course there are no organs so it, that's a very different you know the Coptic church in Egypt um, worships with different instruments so a lot of this is also to do with the fact that we're having this conversation in the west as well um, and it's important for us to remember that um, but I think there is a difference in terms of um, so classical church music I think has always been seen um, as being rooted, I think, and some of this has been spoken about in, in some of the quotes that I gave, um, as being written by Christians and composed by Christians. And both the composition and the performance of that music being seen as part of the liturgical offering, so part of what's happening in worship. Um, whereas some contemporary music, I think, often is, is secular in terms of its composition, sometimes, not always, um, and then is, is incorporated into the life of the church and there can be a disconnect there between either sometimes the people writing the lyrics or the music um, and they're then performed in churches where um, that disconnect can sometimes be felt I think. Um, so when I'm talking about French music in this particular period all the musicians I mentioned um, were Roman Catholics and all of their compositions were influenced and found their origin in um, the liturgical language I think and liturgical soundscape of the church that actually Gregorian chant which was seen as the music of the Catholic Church at you know um, pre-Vatican II at least um, is what shaped and set the tone for everything that they composed even the solo organ music um, which might not have had any one singing to it um, was often based on Gregorian chant um, so it was music in the service of the church um, some contemporary music is like that but not not often and there is a difference there I think um, which is difficult to name when you're not part of that tradition, which I'm not, um, but it is there. Thank you, Jarell. Uh, we have two hands up now. So, um, uh, Tola, uh, I'll come to you in just a moment. Uh, Nala, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, thank you so much, Father, for responding to my first question. You're welcome. You said you are an Anglican priest in the Catholic tradition of the Church of England. Yes. And I actually knew about this kind of, uh, 
of, of church. Okay. Uh, yeah, recently in near Archway, I met a priest from Romania. Yeah. He's married, and, and he said, "Yeah, I am." We were chatting and so on, and then he said, "Yeah, actually, I am." I said, "I am Catholic." He said, "I am Catholic." Like what, what you said exactly, Anglican priest in the Catholic tradition of the Church of England. So he was the first one who introduced me to that. My query now is how do we differentiate these churches? Because, because when we look at the church sign from outside, for instance, we say Catholic church, we, we see Anglican, we see etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So do you really write, is there a plaque that says uh, Catholic tradition of the Church of England? And what's the similarity to the, the other question? What's the similarity to, 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 the, to the order of the mass in the Catholic Church? Sure, sure, sure. That's really useful. Thank you so much, Nala. Thank I, um, you. So we don't put anything outside saying, um, you know, Anglican Church in the Catholic tradition of the Church of England. I think largely because that would almost be as confusing. A lot of this is just communicated by what people see, I think, when they come in. Yeah. Um, so in lots of, of ch Anglican churches in the Catholic tradition of the COV, um, there would be the use of incense, for example, um, bells in the liturgy, the priest would wear vestments, they might be called mother or father, depending on the, the person who's there. Yeah. Um, so a lot of it is communicated in that way, rather than having anything outside. Um, but most Church of England churches are fairly recognisable um, as, as not being Catholic, because the, the interesting thing is, Roman Catholic churches tend not to do the things that Catholic churches in the Anglican tradition do. In England, so often you can tell just by just by looking at it, but it is quite difficult, um, I would say. Yeah. But one, one of the ways in which you would know, I would say, is from looking at what happens in the service. Um, you know, how how are the priests addressed, um, and and sometimes just by asking, to be honest, and saying, you know, what kind of church is this. Um, the first part of your question I've already forgotten. Could you remind me? Yeah, how similar is the order of mass to, to the Catholic Church yeah. in, in that in this kind of tradition? Sure. Um, so the order and the structure is almost exactly the same, I would say. We, we do almost exactly the same things. Uh -huh. um, most Anglican churches in the Catholic tradition wouldn't pray for the Pope. Some some churches would. Again, that's, a, that's an interesting discussion point. Um, so I live very close to a, a church like the one we're talking about. Yeah. Um, which is in the Church of England, but they do pray for the Pope. I um, see. And on the outside, you probably wouldn't know that it was a Church of England church, really. Yeah. Um, and they, they do everything in the Roman Rite as well, completely in the Roman Rite. Oh, la la. So it's quite confusing. Yeah. It's, quite confusing. it's so political. <laughs> yes. And I think the, the argument that, that someone like me would make is that we, we see ourselves as part of the Catholic Church that always existed in England, and we don't see ourselves as disconnected from the wider church we want to acknowledge and recognize yeah. that really there is only one church that we're all part of it we want one church actually we want one church yeah. we can i hope we can see this happening while we're alive so. yeah so. thank you so much for okay. everything such a beautiful beautiful lecture Not and the music you. was amazing and yeah. i liked especially the fact when you talked about your ancestors mm. it is sad it is it's, of course it is sad because it, it refers to the history of slavery that we don't agree to at all yeah. but it's yeah. also you know it's it's so amazing how how you talked about your teachers who taught you music and you know the, their history you know the history of lots of music but you don't know the history of your ancestors and this big begs the big question who are we in this world are we only like uh, related to our ancestors? Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I think I think this is one of the things your your really beautiful question opens up is um, that actually I, I think there's a sense in which people like me who can't trace our ancestors completely have chosen ancestors who are from all over the place. Some some of those are theologians or writers. You know, I feel a a real connection to James Baldwin, the the African American gay writer. Um, yeah. as an ancestor of mine and there are some musicians who I feel so close to that yeah. they do feel like family yeah and yeah. saints as well sometimes amazing yeah. yeah this this universal outlook at things fantastic father thank you so much you're welcome you're welcome thank you very much Nala. thank you Mark um, for enabling me to to ask the questions thanks so much you're welcome um uh, before we move on, I should I feel uh, I should just say um, add to what Jarrell said that in terms of the Catholic tradition within the Church of England, 
um, there are at least two strands, one which accepts the ordination of women and the other one that doesn't. Um, and that's quite a, a significant um, difference, I would say. Um, we're talk before I just quickly before I come to Tola, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, you can correct me. Uh, I, I, I want to say a couple of things. Firstly, technical thing, into, if you want to put your hand up, you just go to the reactions button at the bottom and you'll see raise hand, you should see raise hand. Um, the other thing is that um, we also should acknowledge that, um, you know, there are, um, well, we, we clearly are acknowledging there are controversies and, and differences within within the church and they reflect uh, controversies and differences within society. And so, you know, we, we uh, uh, and so people who come to these talks, you know, feel free to to differ, uh, you know, constructively differ. I'm sure Jarrell is uh, well, well, well able to um, discuss difference uh, even here. OK, so please don't feel that you, uh, Be brave. you can't. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, Tola, may I invite you to speak, please? That was a fantastic preamble for my <laughs> for a, a comment and actually I was only going to have asked one question but then um, Jarelle said something that piqued my interest in just in um, a few moments ago in, in his intervention uh, in response to a question but um, in terms of comment I was just going to say that uh, the ex words exclusive and conservative and liberal and progressive I think that's a very problematic word as well because it can be it's it's so open to interpretation um, uh, more so than I think than other things <laughs> Um, but I think there's all, I think the gospel at its heart has an exclusivity to it. Now, I don't mean that in that I do, I absolutely believe in the inclusivity of the gospel in terms of its reach to all people. Mm. But I think in terms of the demands and even Jesus truth claims about being the way, the truth and the life. And I know there are different interpretations of what that, you know, the truth means in that context, but you know, no one comes to goes but comes to the father, except through me, uh, or heavenly parent, as I like to say, except through me. Um, I think, I think that the idea that, um, yeah, I think the church should be open to all, but I think the idea that um, all things are lawful, I, I, I'll go back to Corinthians, all things are lawful, not all things are expedient. Now I know that again, that's open to interpretation and people, some people have hierarchies of what they think are, are in, well, everyone in a way has hierarchies of what we think are, should be spiritual priorities and what shouldn't be. Um, and maybe that's where the diversions come from. But I, I think there's a tendency to, I think the church does have a check of history when it comes to certain um, groups and social groups and absolutely should own up to that. But I also think um, sometimes if, if the execution has been wrong, um, there's a nugget of truth in some of the intention that's been behind it. And again, I can't speak, you know, people, individuals might have their own mixed motives and, and um, but I guess I'm trying to say that I, I'm, I'm just trying to counterbalance this idea because I missed, unfortunately, my audio dropped out. And so I missed Mark's immediate, um, Mark, Mark made an intervention a few moments ago after Jarrell was talking about the divisions of uh, doctrine and theology in the church. And I didn't hear most of it. I only came in at the part when he said it's an abomination, but you don't have to go through the whole thing. Um, I can maybe guess from some of our personal conversations, Mark, the kind of things that were said, but um, I do feel there's a tendency to, um, I don't know, um, I, I want to say tarnish or people can be, have, people who might take a more, um, I guess, traditional, interpretation of certain aspects of the bible can sometimes get a bad rap and i'm not saying that's because some i'm not saying sometimes that's not deserved but i think it can also be um uh quite dismissive of, of uh, an earnest perspective that's also loving but just maybe a different understanding of loving to to other people's understanding of loving and um grace and truth trying to you know that the tension between the ten well when i say the tensions between grace and truth it, or or the balance between grace and truth. And I know that's something that I know Jarrell has a lot, he's written a whole book on it. But um, uh, so I think that that was my comment. Um, I hope it's not been, it's not too meandering. I hope there's some kind of <laughs> cogency in there somewhere. Um, I was gonna ask in terms of, uh, again, this might be a bit of a delicate one because, and I, I am of African descent myself. So I, 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 I add that um, little um, preface to what I'm about to say, but, uh, 
you did mention, Joelle, that you, you haven't necessarily had much direct interaction with contemporary music stars in terms of your playing and, and um, leading a worship. But I wanted to know what your relationship is, maybe just as a listener with the African-American traditions of uh, organ music, the Hammond B3, that kind of thing. And as I said, I hesitate to ask that because I think if you were from, from a different ethnicity, would I have thought to ask you that? Would I have presumed to ask you that? But um, since you're talking about the organ and, and how this very Western instrument, um, very much located in the classical tradition has been adapted and has become now, in, I think an inherent sound of a different church tradition. I'll be interested to know your thoughts on that. And then my last question is, you mentioned, you talked about, I'm sorry if I misinterpreted, you talked about some worship music or, or, or Christian music being uh, composed in a secular fashion, but adapted for church use, maybe lyrically, and I'm paraphrasing, and which is something that all kind of tugged at me in a way that I thought, no, because I don't believe <laughs> in so much in the secular composition. I, I, you know, the earth is God's and the fullness thereof. So I think if, if the intent is to honor God, then there's no such thing as a secular composition in terms of, it might be that it follows maybe more pop tradition, uh, compositional styles in terms of chord choices, but essentially the music and the, mes the message and lyric, the lyrics, so then to me that it was never a secular, composition and there's sec and there's quotes there's so-called secular music that is very prone to worship and uh honoring of god in a very indirect way so i had a bit i just maybe wanted some clarification about what you meant in terms of secular composition if i haven't misunderstood you right yeah yeah i'll go for the middle one i think um first there was a lot there but i'll try my best um i think um the tradition of the black churches in America is definitely influenced by what's happening in France at the period that I'm talking about, actually. So um, it's interesting how many black American musicians have a connection to the French romantic period that I'm talking about in terms of organ improvisation. And I, I'm not sure that we would see what we see in the black churches in America had the improvisation tradition in France actually begun. So that was, there was definitely a link there. Um, particularly people like Marcel Dupre, who um, I mentioned, who goes to America on a massive tour. His biggest, his biggest tour in his lifetime was in the States. Um, and he meets lots of um, black musicians in that time. Um, and of course the Hammond organ, I think comes, you know, it, it's only made possible by the fact that there's a pipe organ, which is able to do things which the original organs were not able to do. So this, this, the Hammond organ is one of the developments, I think, of what we see being developed in France. So there's definitely a connection there in terms of tradition and lineage. Um, secular music, I think what I mean by that is, is I, I, so I, I would disagree in the sense that I would say that there is, there is secular music, which I think is sung in church because of, I would say it's often because of who it's composed by or who it's written by. Um, and something that I think, you know, kind of straddles that, not, I wouldn't call it secular, but where the lines are kind of blurred, um, is with some of Kanye's music that he's been he's been um, writing in terms of uh, religious music. So Jesus is King, for example, is an album that lots of people love. I listen to it all the time, but I find myself often hindered by um, Kanye's own story and my own um, lack of certainty about where this music is really coming from, um, which is not something I often think about. Are, are you are you speaking in terms of his motivation? Like, is it is it is it, is it are you are you is it a gimmick or is it? But, can, but does that, I, and I hear where you're coming from, but does that in any way change the, because I'm, I'm, I'm in your, in that camp in terms of I'm not, I haven't engaged that much with it, but it, it's, no. it doesn't mean it can't be anointed or, no, did you understand, or, or it doesn't necessarily make it secular per se, even if, because I mean, in that case, no one is going to be able to make music for God because we're all, and that's not to say there isn't a responsibility to, to live out what you profess, but do you understand where I'm coming from in, in, the, in that regard? I think it depends on what we mean by secular. Right? I think I'm, I'm definitely not saying that people can't encounter God through Carnage music, because I do. I think what I'm questioning is, is yeah, I think the, the origin and the, the motive behind it um, and the way in which I would, I would make a distinction between um, music where the whole of a musician's life, like the musicians I'm speaking of, all they did, they made their whole living of being musicians of sacred music, composers of sacred music. Um, they didn't have any kind of secular connection. It doesn't make their life or their music holier. I think it's just, 
it is church music in the sense that all all of their life was about church music um whereas sometimes we have musicians who kind of dip their toe in the church music thing sometimes because it's lucrative or it's just useful um but it is a bit different you know Kirk Franklin is very different to Kanye West right and oh is that what you mean because I was wondering if you were talking about as I said certain kinds of musical styles like a lot no, of no, no. a lot of what is described as CCM is basically Christianized Coldplay or U2 I thought that's what you meant that <laughs> kind of like oh no no because it has a and I think because of the interchange between you know because of the influence of Negro spirituals and gospel, et cetera, et cetera, on most music styles. I'm thinking, well, there's been such a, a symbiosis. I didn't understand, but I think, you know, I, I, I get where you're coming from. It makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tola. Um, Nina, you have your hand up, please come in. Um. Well, yeah, I was just like really fascinated by the conversation that was taking place. I sort of slightly lost my own bearings in terms of, but it kind of had something to do with um, this relationship between uh, playing the notes mm. and the space of interpretation, the latitude of interpretation and then going on to a kind of another territory of total improvisation. And that, that's, that spectrum of practice in relation to playing. And the idea that, uh, because what you showed us was wild, kind of wildly veering onto the, you know, sort of, you know, far off regions of improvisation, because I only heard the Salva Regina line once. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> the end. Yes. Esoterica of, yeah. you know, fabric of, of music that he was like. But I suppose the one thing that, um, yeah, I would be interested to hear what you think is what the relationship, I mean, why is improvisation? I mean, uh, somebody like Maria Callas, who I am been thinking about and working on, says that it's not her job to um, improvise. I mean, she does interpret, but she says, if the musician put a note there, they've put it there for a reason. So it's not for me to change that note. So she considers the truth of her art to be absolutely in precise kind of transcription. But apart from that, what I'm interested in in relation to the spiritual side of what you, you know, what you've been talking about is why is it that improvisation presents this space for the spiritual? You know, what is it about improvising? You know, why because for Callas, it was the precision of the, the relaying of what was written, of what is written. But yet, you know, you're presenting, you're presenting a space where improvisation allows for a certain kind of being in touch with spirituality. So, you know, and also Mark mentioned Donna Matthews, who's doing the PhD on improvisation and the liminal as a form of uh, spirit, form of spirituality, I think. So anyway, can you comment on that aspect? Yeah. Um, so one of the really fascinating things for me is that, you know, the improvisations that we watched, although the first one particularly was very free and esoteric, as you were saying, and there was lots of the kind of transcendent in it and freedom. Um, I was amazed, you know, when I first went to study improvisation, how much rigidity there was in what I was taught. That actually, you know, you're given a Bach chorale and you have to harmonize it. And I remember thinking, gosh, I just want to play like you play. I don't know, I don't want to harmonize this Bach Chorale. Why do I have to do this? Um, but it was because if you don't have a grounding and a foundation in very basic, solid harmony, you can never improvise with freedom. Um, so, you know, you, you, you need to play um, Beethoven and Bach um, and Haydn and Mendelssohn and whoever else as they're written at first in order to develop the kind of freedom that you see in some of the musicians that I showed you. And I think the same is true of theology that actually to do theology with freedom and courage um, and with boldness to venture where perhaps other theologians don't venture, 
you need to have a very solid scriptural foundation to know what what it is that theology is about at its most basic and foundational um, in order to be able to branch out into other types of theology. Um, so I think there is there is this tension that does exist between you know all improvisers in France if they've been trained properly um, are rooted in a very strict rigid um, musical education I think before they come to the kind of freedom that we see um, there and that that freedom is really only possible in an intelligible way because of the strict training that you have at first. Um, so there is a there is a kind of a callas and a French tradition thing happening you know in a sense in both. Um, but in France, you you simply can't study music without um, studying improvisation most of the time, which is very different to how it's taught here. Mm. You know, I have lots of friends who studied organ in, in the UK and in America. Um, and what you do is you just get as much repertoire under your belt. That's all that's important. Um, and being able to learn as much as possible um, of the established repertoire. Improvisation is an optional extra. I mean, I just wondered also, I think there's a comment on that, you know, whether improvisation has something to do with uh, you know, uh, the sort of the um, dissolution of boundaries in some way. Yeah. You know, we, somebody uh, commented on in relation to the playing, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the Lefebvre, I think, uh, yeah. playing, where he was, his whole body was jerking around and sort of almost like in a kind of ecstasy. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I just wonder whether that's what improvisation allows in, in some way as well. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if that's too literal, but you know, I just wondered what 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 made it compatible with the uh, you know the sort of the uh, the possibility of of spirituality you know to happen in that moment uh, you know uh, through improvisation yeah. I think it's definitely seen as being a point in the liturgy in which um, you know the the role of the Holy Spirit, if you like, which is the the free Spirit, yeah. of God, um, is expected to move, and so there are lots of French organists who I know don't like their improvisations recorded because it's for that one moment, for that group of people, then it's gone. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not seen as being something that should really be captured on the whole. Um, mm -hmm. And it is seen as often um, being the moment in which, uh, you know, the, the spirit through the organist is, is making itself present to mm -hmm. that group of people. Um, and there's another French tradition of uh, when you have a choir, that the choir will sing a verse of a hymn, of a Gregorian hymn, so maybe the Te Deum, giving praise to God, and then the organ will play without any choir the other verse, and the sense is um, that the verse that the choir um, don't sing is actually being sung by the angels and saints, mm -hmm. and that the organist is accompanying them even though we can't hear them, and that's a very French thing, it's called alternating, so the choir will go, the organist will go, the choir will go, the organist will go, and that's really seen as um, the heavenly choir meeting the actual choir in church and this being a heavenly encounter really yeah thank you there are some responses to that if mark if you want to read them out or yeah i was just going to say if i could just quickly um just just comment that, that when we're talking about improvisation am i right Jarrell? we're not talking about origination are we we're talking about we're talking about riffing on on, a, on an original or a starting point no so i'm is i'm that actually right about... or is that am i wrong there um, that's, that is one form of improvisation, but the improvisation I'm talking about within the liturgy is often mm. there's there's no, um, I suppose the original, if you like, would be that Gregorian chant, mm. and that's yeah. it, but it's literally, it's, it contributes so little, I think, to the improvisation, um, that it's probably not fair to say that they're kind of riffing off the original, it's just that that tiny portion of the sequence um, shapes the improvisation, but everything else is free. Okay. Um, Thank you. Okay, I'm going to read out some comments here because they're suddenly coming in, flooding in as we reach the end of our time. Um, uh, oh, and there's a, actually there's a question here as well, um, which I'm just going to leave with you because it's a deceptively simple one, but I can see it's going, it might have a quite a complex answer. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, yes. Uh, can you tell when you listen to a piece of organ music if it's been composed by a male or a female? I'll just leave it with you, just leave that with you for the moment. Um, improvisation, I suppose it could be like the difference between creative writing or reading the text only, what is written, or a performance poet, spoken word artist versus a po poet who sticks to what they've written on the page. Uh, that's, uh, sorry, that's, I could credit that, that's Louise and Toller, respectively. Alex, uh, that discipline is exactly the same in jazz. And as far as Callas is concerned, the cadenzas she sang came out of a tradition of improvisation in earlier opera singing 
and were often written by people other than the composers of the operas in which we hear them, with many alternatives which are now seldom heard because of what we have become used to in recordings of singers such as Callas. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. So there's a dynamic in the dialectic there. Harry uh, Cedar says, prayer is the personal reflective space. And oops, this popped out of my view, sorry. P prayer is a personal reflective space and is open to improvisation, while scriptural texts are not improvised, but interpreted. Nice observation. Uh, uh, Tollers said, although I respect and understand Callas' point of view, I find it very indicative of European rigidity and quite imperialist. The idea there's one way to do something and it's usually been standardized by an elite according to their tastes. Uh, I imagine Mark would say this could be reflective of church history as well, and I'd agree, depending on the theme of theological diverg divergence, um, winky tongue out uh, emoji. So, uh, Jarell, I'll let you, because we've, we've, we've only got a few minutes left, so I'll, I'll let you respond however you, however you would like to those content, uh, con comments, but thank you so much for everybody for making them. I'm trying to think of what I want to say, really. I think hmm. I'm trying to find one of the quotes that I didn't get to share, which I think might be quite useful. Um, so in terms of kind of church music and the freedom that we have, and also the sense of prayer, I think, within, um, you know, music and liturgy, um, and to go back to that sense, I think, of, you know, the fact that we're all always improvising, that actually... I think it was T.S. Eliot that said, you know, the best poets steal, basically, that, you know, actually in most people's music, the more you get familiar with a composer, every now and again, I hear something and I think, gosh, I've heard that before, and I suddenly realise that they take it from somewhere else. Um, so very, very little is actually original. Um, but this is something that um, is written in a book called A Sense of the Sacramental, to take it back, really, to where we started, that sense of how music can en enable an encounter with the divine. Um, this writer says, and it's written by David Brown and Anne Lodes um, from a book from 1995, that just as perishable things such as bread and wine can convey the gift of eternal life, so can the noise and changes within a piece of music successfully speak of the peace and changelessness of God. We discover ourselves to be living in a world that overflows with the sacramental once we open our ears as much as we do our eyes. And I think really what, what most of the musicians I spoke about were trying to do was enable us not just to listen better to God, but I think also to listen better to each other and ourselves, um, to create spaces in which um, we don't talk across each other or fill every silence with, with noise, but enable ourselves to pay attention, I think, um, not only to, to God, but also to us. And I think that's one of the primary gifts of music, that it enables us to pay attention to each other, to pay attention to our bodies um, and to pay attention to God. Um, and, and that happens in so many different ways through art, I think art opens up vehicles to the spiritual and to the religious for us. Um, and that's its great gift, I think. And as a priest and a musician, in some ways, very little has changed. <laughs> that's still really part of what I'm trying to do is be a vehicle for the grace of God, whether I'm at the altar or at the piano or at the organ, um, it's the same thing. Um, trying to create moments of encounter with something which isn't me. Jarell, thank you so much. That was a beautiful end to a beautiful presentation. And I'd like to think it's it's a very apt summation of, of what Nina and I have been trying to do in our different ways, um, to try and give space to listen to one another um, through, through the discussion of art and, and thereby perhaps to listen to God as we understand in our different ways. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'm now going to uh, thank everybody for coming. Uh, thank James for uh, looking after us so well, and I'm going to hand over to Nina to say uh, a few closing remarks uh, for tonight, but also on the series as a whole. Thank you again, everybody. And Nina, you're muted. Yes, yeah, sorry. Just uh, to say, repeat what Mark has said in a very heartfelt way. Thank you very much, Arel, for a, a wonderful and very instructive talk. Actually, it was it was really uh, quite uh, and get you know sort of um, engaging with a very specialist area that I that I've learned a lot about through you. Um, so thank you very very much. It was very and also in an expanded way, opening it out to these other kind of territories that we a little bit touched on. Thank you so much.
And um, also to say, like with Mark, thank you, James, for all your help uh, throughout this, um, and um, to all of you for coming um, and following the series. Um, I don't really have very much more to say other than I suppose in my in our minds, it's been quite a, an experimental and interdisciplinary space, I feel. And I think the word experimental has been particularly important, at least to me, I think to Mark as well. Experimental in the sense that, you know, Jarrell, when we met you earlier on, we, we you know, we just, we, 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 you said, oh, I haven't done this before. And in a way, it was like that for us as well. We hadn't done this before either. So it, it has been quite experimental with intersections of things that we, you know, didn't know how they were going to work out. Uh, but there's been interest, there's been a following, and uh, we've had a great, uh, we had a great symposium to start with. And then we followed up with wonderful presentations, over 30 artists that have presented, artists, writers, theorists. So it was very varied. Uh, absolutely fantastic, um, very regular, you know, very kind of energetic. And then we've sort of ended with these wonderful four talks by specialists in their field and by practitioners as well, you know, intersecting with practice. So I feel, you know, that for Mark and myself, the practice side of it has kind of, you know, kept it all very much uh, within the, the frame uh, that we wanted, which is one of practice. And what does it mean, you know, to... Uh, to engage with practice and religion, two fields that were sort of, in a sense, a little bit disconnected. But I think we were both talking earlier before we came on, and I think I can speak for Mark because we both felt that in a small way, you know, it's opened up that field of practice uh, within uh, art academia in particular, but also within the, the field of art practice as well, visual practice. So I think the, the, these spaces that we, you all participated and we've all taken part in has opened up a little bit of a space there that perhaps previously didn't quite exist in the same kind of way. So thank you all very much for being participants in it. And just to say that this is all thanks to a Chase grant, um, which has been wonderful. And we are applying for another top up. So if that comes through, then we'll be brainstorming and, and, and thinking about how we take it forward into 22, 23. If that grant doesn't come through, then this is our, our wrapping up session, but hopefully it will come through. Uh, and um, so, yes, I mean, so you're all on the mailing list. We'll, we'll be in touch with you unless you unsubscribe, of course. Um, and um, basically we are very likely to be calling out, you know, for, su for suggestions or uh, letting you know what our thoughts are a little bit further on as we as we sort of get together and, and, and discuss things. So that's all really. And thank you so much. It's been great, very exciting. And uh, there's a wonderful storehouse of materials that are on YouTube now as a result of all this initiative that you've all taken part in. And so thank you very much. And it's been fantastic, I feel. Mark, do you want to say anything? You, you're, you're no, Nina, I think you've I think you summed it up beautifully. Um, but just to say that uh, the storehouse is accessible via the website, religionandart.org. Um, so uh, I could put that in the chat, actually. Let me just... Yeah. James, would you mind doing that while, while, while we just wrap up? Sure. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, and actually, I would just like to say, I hope this isn't too uh, mundane, but um, when Nina spoke about the Chase grant, um, that was really just for the mechanics of, of this. None of the presenters have been paid. Nobody's, and, 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 and you know, and it, it's, it's all, you know, we, this has all been done voluntarily. Um, and uh, and you have come voluntarily, but we haven't charged you. So, you know, it's one of the, from our project side, which is my side, um, you know, we, it's all, all, everything we do is, is, is free and open to all. Um, and uh, Nina, although she's representing Goldsmiths here, um, you know, this is also in, in, uh, in, in Nina's initiative. So, um, oh, so once you. again, thank you uh, 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 to Jarrell for giving up your time to not just come and speak to us, but to prepare your presentation. Um, and um, yes, thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Keep cool. God bless. Bye. Yeah.